first of all, thank you to Ram Madhavji for uh, you know bringing us all together on this annual pilgrimage, which stopped and paused for a couple of years, but good to be between all of you. Well, I wanted to start off where Shamika ji just left. It is this problem of an aging economy. And let us throw light on India. India is one of the youngest nations, but we all know that our TFI, the total fertility rates, are actually going down drastically. So we are not replacing the same number of young people as they are going old and dying. So you can imagine this window of opportunity that we in India have is no more than two and a half decades. So we have somewhere around 20 to 25 years to develop, develop rapidly enough so that we are not stuck into something which is called a low income trap or a middle income trap. Malaysia is one example which is now permanently stuck in this uh, middle income trap. The reason is they could not grow sufficiently rich before they grew old. Now the same challenge remains before India as well. How do you utilize this time window, a very short time window, two and a half decades is not a long time in the journey of a nation. So it is a small time window. You need to create economic opportunities for across the strata. You need to create enough opportunities for people who are low skilled, Healthcare becomes a very important sort of piece of the puzzle over there. There is a middle tier which will be grabbed by the climate change opportunities which will come out as JNG was highlighting. But what do you do with the highly skilled folks who've largely relied on the IT revolution which has taken care of massive amount of aspirational youth coming into the job market? We all understand that the IT behemoths in India had struggled uh, considerably uh, over the past uh, few years to reimagine themselves, rejuvenate, come out with new offerings on the world stage. Here, I want to be the evangelist for the Web3 and the Web3 related economic opportunities that are out there. Let me begin with, you know, trying to lay out what is Web3. We all know what Web1 was. Web1 was a simple website. You know, uh, entrepreneurs used to create static websites which you can read and not contribute to. That created one phase of wealth creation. The second very big wave of wealth creation which we are seeing currently is called Web2. Web2 was where the web, web world opened. You could, you know, interact with people on the other side of the computer. You could interact a lot of trillions of dollars of wealth was created for Web2. You know, the Facebooks, the Twitters of the world were created, which became behemoths and are dominating the conversations we have today. Similarly, Web3, which is in its very much of an infancy, is trying to create opportunity where decentralized structures and the building blocks are being laid as we speak. The future of Google, the future Googles of, of, uh, of, of Web3 are being, those codes are being written as we speak. And these are where India surprisingly has enormous advantage. By any measure, India has some of the best developers which are there for Web3 ecosystem. We have lakhs and lakhs of such developers which are emerging and they are, they are the principal coders for Web3 uh, building blocks and they are dominating all the conversations that are happening. But in order to further promote Web3, there are, and there are various parts of it. We have heard about how cryptocurrency went belly up. You know, this is a maturing industry. It will take several such rounds of, you know, course correction, understanding what is going wrong with the cryptocurrency world. There will be blockchain technologies. Governments will have to tailor make themselves to suit to what is happening on the blockchain front. Then you have decentralized finance, which is even more of an evolved uh, world which we, uh, we believe is going to completely dismantle how we know finance. Anything centralized, any bank, any uh, venture capital, anything where a system centrally takes a decision as to where should capital be deployed is going to be massively disrupted. And decentralized finance is actually building those guardrails for that. You know, when you talk to youngsters who are studying at IIT, engineering colleges and all, they, they are more interested in the post-sovereign world order. They, they are more interested in how can they develop applications, how can they move capital without any concern for borders. And this is a regulatory nightmare. 
we as, as in our regulators today are far away from this fast approaching tsunami of, uh, of disruptions and technologically led disruptions which is going to change the status quo. And they are not, as of now, they are not in tune with how this economy 2.0 or you want to call it as economy 4.0 is going to completely change their roles and responsibilities in a matter of few years. So I think the challenge remains uh, for an economy 2.0 is this upper echelon, uh, the, the high skilled folks who are now completely intellectually invested in building out these corporations for the future. And I'm telling you, some of the fastest trillion dollar wealth has been created in Web3 in the history of wealth accumulation uh, of mankind. So I personally feel that uh, in order to uh, further uh, sort of get ready for what is coming our way. Our governments have to fall in place. Our incumbent Web 2.0 behemoths have to have to give space and allow creative destruction to happen so that the Web 3 uh, 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 disruptive technologies can come in, add more value, bring more value. And the big question remains, how do you deal with these corporations? How do you regulate them? Because today, corporations are being created on blockchains. You do, do not need to have a registered company certified kind of a uh, uh, you know, corporate entity that, that we have normally uh, come to believe in. These companies, there are decentralized autonomous organizations which are on a decentralized level running parallel governments on blockchains. How do you regulate them? Or can the sovereign entity as a state even do anything about it? These are deeply philosophical questions which are going to be thrown at us in a very brief time from now. So that's where I would leave certain thoughts with you. And I believe that economy 2.0, as I envision, what is going to shape the next 20, 30 years is going to be these conversations, especially in the, uh, the upper, higher uh, uh, skilled labor force. Thank you.